Thank you, Judy. Thank you for inviting me here, and um, it's been really such an honor to to be the one to moderate um, today between Emma and Tahir. Um, and before I continue, um, please make sure you, you get a copy of this. This is the catalog that just came out, and the essay is by Kelly uh, Vong um, from the Metropolitan Museum. And it's gorgeous, and there's a, there's a lot in here that's really meaningful, so thank you. Where do you find them? Um, on the fifth floor, right? Yeah, they're yeah. for sale. Uh, $10 on the fifth floor. Oh, worth it. Yes, and I, again, I urge you to see the exhibition once again, um, if you haven't already, or after this talk, perhaps, there may be another um, impulse to want to go downstairs and look more closely at the work. There's, there's quite a lot of material in this show. There's a lot of content, there's a lot of stories. Um, we want to take our time, but we also want to uh, provide you with time to have questions. So we're probably going to go about 40 minutes or so. Um, we're going to sort of have a cycle through some the images of the work, which, you know, better to see in person, I would say, but just to refer to. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions. So I think um, I wanted to start with Emma. If that's all right. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do, just to give you a sense of things, is, you know, because really this, this pairing has been so fortuitous in a way. Um, these two lovely artists didn't know one another before. And as you can imagine, you know, for artists, a two-person show, um, it's, it's really quite rare. It almost looks like they have known each other and they have been in dialogue before. Uh, so I think what we're going to find out here is, you know, where the crossovers happen and, and where they each are very sort of individually um, marked by their process. So we're going to go through what the narratives, narratives are first behind the work, how you arrived at making the work that you make, um, the stories, um, and then the process and the technical um, skill and nuances behind that. And then I would like to also explore, if we have some time after that, how the process itself really imbues the narrative. So very simple, but well, there's, I'll let you begin. <laughs> so um, with Emma, please. Perfect, well thank, thank you very so much. much. And just um, hello to everyone, and a really, uh, a big thank you to IPCMY. Uh, the staff has been amazing. And, um, to Regine for moderating, thank you, thank you. And to hear, it's been a pleasure. It's super exciting to get to know you and your work. Um, and so a little bit of background about my work and um, the work that's in the show and what I've been thinking about and what I've been researching. Um, I am half Japanese Canadian, half Scottish Canadian, um, very Canadian. Um, my dad's side of the family, uh, my grandparents on my dad's side of the family were both interned during the war as Japanese Canadians. Um, and so it's been about 10 years now that I've been exploring this narrative and that history. Um, I think my point of access initially began because I was interested in what it was to be mixed um, and kind of wanting to look at both sides of, um, of my background. Uh, but when I started to dig into the Japanese Canadian side, um, I just have been digging and digging, and it's 10 years now, and we're still going. Um, so the works that are in the show, there's several different pieces, uh, different series of works. Initially, um, kind of one of the pieces is a large map, and I've um, kind of mapped the interior of British Columbia, where the internment happened. Um, but while I was doing all of this research around my family's history, I was kind of finding oral history accounts and I was um, kind of reading different novels as well as academic writings and I wanted to find a way to bring in that history into the work itself. Um, and so if you look at these maps that detail the different areas where people were interned, um, you'll find that it's all text. And I was transcribing all of the writing that I was encountering in terms of my research. Um, but the text is all really, really tiny and, and you can't read it very well. Um, if you use a magnifying glass, you can maybe make out little parts of it. Um, and part of the reason for making it so small was to 
address the fact of, kind of how little known these stories are um, and of, of how difficult it is to access these stories. There was a lot of silence growing up. My grandparents really didn't talk about the internment. I knew little bits and pieces. Um, when I talked to my aunt about her experience of finding out about um, her parents' internment, she said in looking through the family photos from my grandfather, he just said that's where I worked. There was no context mm -hmm. of um, kind of what he had been doing or why he was there. Um, my grandmother really talked about her early childhood, spent between Canada and Japan, but really didn't talk about the internment. Um, so I kind of began all of this work after they had both died, and it's been trying to piece together their history, um, kind of through happenstance. I've met different friends who knew them, and I've been able to piece things together. Um, but initially, it really started off as kind of looking at my family story, and then as the work has grown, it's now um, kind of being more inclusive of the larger Japanese Canadian experience. And I've been I've gone on to interview different um, generations of Japanese Canadians of kind of how do we pass on these stories from generation to generation. Um, I'll kind of leave it there. Great, thank you. Um, and um, moving on to you, Tahir, you want to give a sense of um, how you arrived at working similarly with, um, in your case, migratory patterns, um, colonialism, I would say, and um, histories of oppression or trauma, um, yeah, for sure. Um, how, how I started uh, working on this. Um, so, um, I too am a uh, mixed race as well. Um, my mother is from the Seychelles, and uh, my father is Kenyan, but of Indian ancestry. And um, I was actually kind of, uh, when I moved to New York City, and I finished my master's, I, um, started looking into um, figuring out more about um, trying, trying to build a narrative. Because a, lot of, a lot of what I was going through at the time was um, a lot of uh, application documents and a lot of sort of like this idea of identity and like where I wanted to be and what it meant to be who I am here in New York City and who I was in Nairobi or who I am in Nairobi and like thinking about whether I wanted to stay in New York City or move back and practice in Nairobi at the same time. Um, and during all of this, I was sort of um, trying to figure out after my graduate degree whether I'd be, be like an assistant or like just be like, I'll be an assistant and then move back to Nairobi and I'll like do this whole thing. Um, that never worked out. Uh, and um, I actually ended up working, I, I ended up getting a residency at uh, Brick. And the whole premise of the residency was to sort of go into and think about sort of the colonial history of Kenya and like how my parents had met and that whole process. But when I asked my father for like photographs and all of these references from history and all this kind of stuff, he actually sent me a lot of like documentation about, because essentially I really wanted to sort of talk about like uh, Kenyan Indians and the railway and that entire history with, uh, with uh, British East Africa. But he actually sent me a lot of these sort of um, documents that dealt with identity and they dealt with moving to Kenya and so, I didn't know this, but I thought that my family had moved to Kenya post World War One or post World War Two, but in fact, had they moved to Kenya like pre World War One? So this was like eighteen ninety. Um, so this is like really kind of in the heights of um, what is it, the, the empire. And so. I began kind of going through all of this and sort of not really looking into my mother's history anymore um, and kind of really diving into it and figuring out like how could I um, interpret like this entire history and like how much like paperwork meant, um, especially with this very bureaucratic British government where a lot of people in Kenya during, even though they were there for a really long time, had to sort of wear like these lanyards um, to like say that they're um, allowed to be on this particular uh, land. Um, and so 
at the same time, I'm doing my own visa application documents, and it, there was just so much like overlap um, and history and like this sort of this idea of like having to ask for permission to all of these governments for me to like traverse borders, um, and then I just ended up making like pulping the paper as a sort of like making documents and creating like re thinking and reclaiming this idea of like how much this paper means to me, you know. You know, it's, someone once said to me, as you were both speaking, I was thinking about this actually, that's, and it's helpful to, to think about this, is, um, you know, because you're both artists, and it, it, it puts you in the position of not only sort of personally affected by this story, but you're also a witness to a particular um, history or moment in history, you know, you've grown up with this, like the relics of that history, uh, which I very much identify with. Um, and it has its own sort of hidden psychological effect, you know, on the family and on how they are with you and you are with them and so on and so forth. And so maybe that's part of the embodiment question, really. But um, so as artists, you know, it's, it's a huge responsibility uh, to be carrying the weight of that history, um, and to you know, be up here, for instance, speaking like representing that history in a sense. <laughs> Not to stress you out. <laughs> Don't be stressed. I'm just saying. Um, you know, I think part of what's so wonderful about the work um, that you both do is that it seems as though you've you've really kind of like in a cathartic way actually poured that sort of weight into the process of making the work. So it's not Ill illustrative, it's mm -hmm. not this documentary uh, situation that you know, so easily, could, easily could happen. Text, photo, print, you know, this is the story, this is the text. Um, but there is definitely something kind of imbued and almost regurgitated, let's say. So I'd like to speak about the process now. Um, I don't know who would like to go first. They will take the same order, <laughs> Emma, if you uh, could, again, like if you can give us a sense of the trajectory, like how you arrived at, you know, yeah. making me. Yeah. Um, I think that was kind of beautifully put, and it's this, this, I think, pressure really when I first started exploring this work was how do I kind of tell this story? Um, you know, I, I found some photos, but I didn't have much. But what I really came across initially was this box of my grandmother's old sewing patterns. Um, and this box contained about 200 articles of kind of small articles of clothing. They're all beautifully made of craft paper, all hand sewn, and she was taking a drafting course. And that was in 1941. And there were all these books of patterns in it. And then inside one of the books of patterns was this little sheaf of notebook paper and that was dated 1943, and it was full of Japanese names and measurements, and she was clearly making clothes for other people when she was in the camps. Mm -hmm. And so I found this box, and I, um, I remember I was at my mom's house, and she came in, and I ran up the stairs and said, look what I found, and she said, oh, did, oh, did you make that? And I said, no, but did in 1941. And for, it took me several months, and I just sat with the weight of this box, of how do I tell her story? How do I explore this history? Well, kind of honoring her craftsmanship and her abilities, but also kind of tell this, this larger story. Um, and over the last 10 years, the work has really kind of shifted. It started with exploring these sewing patterns. I learned how to read her patterns. I created my own garments. And it was kind of thinking of these ideas of gestures of memorialization. How do I echo her movements, but I, I can't recreate what she would have made? Um, kind of aware of that echo and the, kind of the futility of not being able to fully connect, um, but kind of interested in that space between her work and my work. And so that's where the work started, and then um, I kind of was making then garments that would fit me, but they were all made of paper and I couldn't, I couldn't actually wear them. Um, and then I moved into um, well, I did a big trip out west to visit the internment campsites, and that was really important uh, for a, kind of my family and I did that at kind of pilgrimage in a way, and that was a very important experience for us all to have together. 
um, and it was kind of experiencing that landscape. And the landscape of the Canadian internment, Japanese Canadian internment, is very different than the American Japanese uh, internment in that it's kind of within the mountains and it's in this kind of beautiful interior British Columbia setting where, you know, it wasn't the barbed wire fences and the watchtowers, it was the mountains and kind of one road that went through the mountains and there was an RCMP officer at either end of the road and the mountains became kind of that prison. And so it was also then reconciling, you know, this, this beauty of this place with the history. Um, and so downstairs you'll see kind of a map series that maps out that landscape. You'll also see a sculpture um, that kind of recreates this mountainscape. Um, but I think through, and then you'll see another piece that uses kind of all of these family photographs that I found. Um, but I think through all of it, it's been about kind of how do I tell this history? How do I explore these ideas of the weight of memory? Um, yeah, you write on the... So this piece here is called an archive of rememory. So I've used, um, I found all these kind of beautiful family albums from my grandparents and I um, kind of scanned in all of these photographs and I've turned those into photo etchings and then I worked with a paper making studio and they um, handmade all of this paper and worked with a sculptural paper making technique where you beat the pulp for longer than usual so these fibers get really short. Um, and then we form the paper and I actually print my photo etching on it before the paper gets to fully dry. And then I wrap this paper around a mold of sand and I kind of tie up these photographs. And then when the paper dries, uh, the fibers shrink and everything gets really, that paper gets really hard and stiff. Then I cut a hole in the bottom and I drain out the sand. So all of these bundles um, are actually hollow. And so the wrapping technique that I'm using to wrap them all is um, from traditional Japanese wrapping uh, called a furoshiki. So you take a square of cloth or of paper and you can wrap up anything. Um, the kind of the use of a furoshiki can be very utilitarian. You can wrap up your lunch, you can wrap up your belongings, um, but you can also wrap gifts this way. So this series was really looking at kind of how do we pass on these memories to different generations. Um, and kind of what gets kept secret, what gets shared. Uh, because the paper dries so hard, you actually can't untie these packages anymore. Um, the only way to do that would be to kind of destroy it. You can't ever see that full image. Um, we are just offered kind of fragments of, these, of this history. Um, and so, kind of I would say labor and time is another huge part of my work, but that's maybe kind of a third question mm -hmm. to get to. I just have to ask, sorry to go off topic a little bit, but as you're mentioning this, I've noticed that you've titled them after the certain families that you've worked with, and, um, and what is their awareness of, I mean, have, I think I remember you saying you gave one to them as yeah. well as... Kept so, them. kind of a series of works that's, these ones, thank you. <laughs> um, so this series is called Collected Stories, and so this is kind of immediately, kind of, as in, kind of another detour after I made these sculptural pieces. Um, I was doing these drawings of these furoshikis, and then I started to interview different members of the Japanese Canadian community. Um, so this piece is Harold Miwa, I believe. Um, Harold was 13 when he went into the internment camps. Um, and so I sat down with him and Kyo, which is the other piece that's downstairs in the show, and I interviewed the two of them together and I was asking them questions and then they were asking each other questions and beautiful questions that I, I don't think I would have thought of or kind of felt like I had permission to ask. Uh, and then I transcribe all the interviews and then these pieces are all also made of text and a transcription of those interviews. Um, and so kind of thinking of the first shiki as um, kind of a, a way to wrap gifts because these are, and it's a small edition of prints that I'm able to give and one of these prints to each of the storytellers. Um, and that's been a lovely way to give back to those families um, and <coughs> really give acknowledgement to that story um, and the weight of those stories. Um, so it's been kind of a real, kind of a give and take for, for the whole community. And it's really just about finding people too who are willing to share their stories. Because a lot of people you know, don't want to sit down and tell those stories. 
But I also think just in terms of time, uh, those who were interned are all getting pretty old now. Uh, so there's this real sense of kind of urgency right now to record these stories and talk to as many people who are who are willing to, to share right now. Thank you. <clears throat> it's it's really remarkable how you're also able to take a traditional, you know, not necessarily ritual because you said it is very everyday as well, but but create a sort of alternative ritual in a sense. And it's always helpful to have a kind of third space to talk through. So it's not this one-on-one, -on -one, but it's, you know, let's do this thing. Absolutely. <clears throat> I find that. And in your case, to Tahir, um, having known your work previously, yeah. um, you've also been involved in, I mean, I don't, you're going to pick up from wherever you pick up is fine, but just to segue, <laughs> because I know there's so many parts to, to your work, but the Kuba cloth, for instance. There's also been elements of working with um, traditional African textiles or that have their own history and then also bringing it into a new space and a new kind of context. Um, but please go ahead if you wanted to pick up on the idea of how you arrived at the um, specific process with the paper. Uh, well, you were asking about the responsibility of artists in history and yeah. like representing that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, I never, uh, listening to Emma speak about um, the work, I, I, I never thought about, about creating the work in that way. Um, and it, it, it's a, which is interesting in terms of like the process because it's like, uh, it's kind of, I'm very self-involved. Um, and it was. You're an artist. <laughs> it, it was. It was. The, it, it, initially, it was a project about um, like uh, I started working about. It was going to be these like large sheets of paper with like these Dalam self portraits like on top of it. Um, and the more I started working with the practice, the more I started sort of like learning um, how to make sheets of paper. And, what I was doing, it sort of changed into this sort of like ritualistic thing. Um, and at the same time, sort of dealing with my lawyer and um, dealing with like the American government and all of that kind of stuff, like, and that sort of ritualistic process of like filling out the applications, finding all of these sort of like this information, putting it together, collating it, like arranging it and uh, filing it and then putting it away. Which is a self portrait in yeah, that way. Yeah, which is a self portrait. Basically, I. While I was doing that, the paper making um, started to just sort of emulate that part of my life, and it hasn't stopped ever since. And like, I feel like I'm constantly putting out these documents, but um, I just never, uh, I never, I, I never really thought about like the represent, like the representation of like talking about the um, like British East Africa and all of that it was just sort of like oh this is like the history and this is like what's happening and this is how i, I did my research and i like i put it together but I, I never thought about like the viewer in that respect i always thought about it as like my um this is just happened to be the story of migration um that my family um, went through and like these are the stories about the railway just it was sort of like and I think like now that I think about it, I should have probably <laughs> um, had a little bit more like pretext to actually what was going on, what, like what, because a lot of people ask me about like British East Africa, a lot of people don't know about it, and a lot of people don't know about like uh, like German East Africa either, or even like the railway, the, the Ugandan railway for that matter. Um, and. I think that it subtly brings in the these conversations without having to sort of like I mean it just sort of like fades in like the sheets of paper and like that kind of mess that it just kind of like falls into the paper and like it comes out and it just sort of like weaves itself into like the narrative of everything. And essentially what happened when I was making when I started making these sheets of paper and I was really into like putting the portraits into the paper for a while. Um, that kind of melted away, and I started being more interested in like landscapes and interested in like the idea of access and 
what I'm doing is I'm creating these self-portraits of, like, as we were talking about these applications, so I could have access to landscapes. Um, so right. I started making these sort of like topographic landscape abstractions and started putting in the rust and started putting in that sort of like. Yeah, have some images here. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then that kind of built into sort of like more, not necessarily only like my narrative of like my experience with migration and uh, crossing borders, uh, but it sort of turned into the process of making paper emulating or being that metaphor. And I think that's when we started. When, I, when you met me is when that part of the narrative of paper making started to unfold where you think about the sheets of paper um, or like the pulped paper as like individuals being trapped in the screen or being allowed to go through or not being allowed to go through. And essentially paper making is a filtration process and the border itself is a filtration process and that's governed by the papers that you hold. Um, and so I exposed the process of paper making onto these like large screens so that it comes more sort of like um, less about my history and more about this is the state of how the world is operating and how our borders are operating now. So. Right, yeah, you, have, you pulled back. Um, it almost had a bird's eye view effect as yeah. well with the screens. I mean, sometimes it does look like you're looking above at yeah. land masses, um, mm. or it could be very microcosmic too, because you really see the organic matter trapped within the pixels of the screen mm -hmm. as well um, and I think similarly but differently in the paper works that are stacked I wanted to get an image of that so I'm looking at the book here yeah thank you um, yeah now these just to give some chronology these are earlier than the screen print the screen installations or are these simultaneous? Oh, okay, so you see that sheet of paper, um, the one with like that string with the S, yeah. kind of sticking down. Like evolution. That was the installation that we put at yeah. Pioneer Works. And so paper making then became my drawing practice as well. So I actually started drawing and like coming up with ideas for installations and just like general things in my life, like onto the sheet of paper. Mm. So it started to become ritualistic and just a record. So it would start to become a notebook. And yeah, so this, these were sort of like happening simultaneously. Um, and that is actual, that's the actual first drawing for the installation that we did at Pioneer Works mm. um, together. Yeah. yeah, and so it was kind of both happening and like, I think uh, there is a way that you can see stylistically how it changes over the years um, by the residency I've been in. So like, if there's rust, that's post McDowell. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the blank sheets were made at brick. Um, yeah, it's like a whole, it's a really interesting, I was actually like when, when Judy came over, to my apartment and I had all of these sheets of paper just like under the bed. Um, we went through the whole chrono chronology of it and then it just was sort of, I, I didn't realize like how much this was like part of my life. And I actually started tearing up like going through this because like, oh, all these sheets of paper have so much memory attached to it mm -hmm. and so much time attached to it and I was just like, I'm like, oh, should I be crying at a studio visit? <laughs> <laughs> Granted, I mean, it's, yeah, as you said, and that, that is a good segue into this next, next level that we're getting to, because, um, yeah, it's embodiment. It's very much, you know, and I mean, in, in um, Emma's case, there's, um, you know, like a, a, a relationship to the material. Um, and you have a relationship to the material, but that you're sort of also living the story of migration as well, currently. And in a way, I, I would say that there's, um, I mean, not to make a comparison, I mean, you know, it's, these, are, these are parallel and woven together in many ways, 
but I, I feel like there's, there's something to be said for um, these paperworks, these you know, installations and so on, that are living material, is what I want to say. They're kind of like organic, and it's part of, I think, your awareness of them as well. It's, it's in there. Um, so if you would mind speaking towards that. So. I think just even kind of thinking of what do you're, you were talking about, kind of this relationship that you have with, with the different pieces of paper, and um, kind of this, this way that things kind of anthropomorphize, and you have these kind of very strong connections. Um, I would say in, in a lot of my work, if I'm working with photographs, then there's a way that I'm kind of spending time with the people in the photos, lots of whom are kind of relatives and family members who are no longer here. So it's this interesting way where you kind of spend a day in the studio with, with family um, or with these faces of people that I don't know, um, which is then kind of also interesting. Um, I think when I'm working with the text pieces, um, and sorry, maybe if you can go back to the collective stories ones. Um, so when I'm working on these etchings, there's a way that I, so I've kind of sat down with the people and I've done the interview and then I've transcribed the interview. But then when I work on the etching, I, I've done a drawing and then basically I'm slowly transcribing um, the interview. And I'll do that over the course of kind of four to six months. They take a long time. And so they're really, it's writing really tiny, so I can only do a couple hours in a day or my body will be very unhappy with me. Um, but there's a way that you then kind of just sit with these stories um, for multiple hours. So I'm, I'm kind of living that story over and over again. And so sometimes it's helpful actually to have two pieces on the go because then I can kind of spend a day with somebody else mm. and change it up. Um, but it's, it's something different to kind of just to hand transcribe a conversation. And usually I'll transcribe these um, kind of multiple, multiple times. Um, depending on how much text is in a piece, maybe I've transcribed it kind of 10 to 15 times. So by the end, I actually kind of am very familiar with that story. Um, so I think the, the aspect of labor <laughs> is, a, is a big part of my work. Um, and of and of time and um, I think there's you know kind of the the art making part of my brain is always thinking like oh I want to you know what's the next kind of complex exciting piece that I can work on um, and I like to do tiny things and I like to do multiple tiny things um, so there's kind of that side but then the other part is just spending time with these stories and what kind of unexpected relationships emerge out of that process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been exciting to watch over the years of how I'll start off thinking about the project in one way, but then kind of unexpected things will happen as you're, as you're working. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask the fiber, I think what's really interesting is the fibers from the Furushiki. If you mm -hmm. can tell us how you sort of came up with a process for turning it. And this is paper geek. <laughs> <laughs> um, turning that process. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I will not take credit for uh, for inventing that. I have friends who ran a paper making workshop or paper making studio in Toronto called Paper House, and they were offering a sculptural paper making course. Mm. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna come. And I had had already made furoshiki form using um, kind of photo etching and photogravure prints that I printed onto regular Japanese paper, and had been kind of tying up these furoshiki. Um, but I was, I had to fill them with different kinds of paper and I was curious if I could approach this through kind of a paper making approach. Um, and so I kind of went to this, you know, kind of, I think it was a two day workshop and had two different projects that I was really interested in, whether paper making could work. Um, so basically in terms of the pulp that we're using, it's a mixture of flax and abaca fibers. And then um, in different ratios, that's how you're getting different colors of the paper. Um, but it's just, it's really through the beading time and kind of this lengthy drawn out beading time that the fibers get really short. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of said, this is my project. And he said, okay, well, this is how you should approach it and we'll try it out. Mm -hmm. And so I made a couple on that day and then now I've made over 450 of them. And, uh, yeah, I like to do a lot of one thing. Well, <laughs> well um, 
I mean, the, the idea of, of, of repetition also, I think, puts you in that frame of yeah. mind, in a sense, right? And um, I, I would imagine that with you, similarly, when you're pulping paper, there's that kind of process, and we've talked about this ritualistic process and it being part of it. And I think we've, we've probably gone over, you have anything that you'd like to add about the process before we open it up to questions? Yeah, um, I think what's interesting and why I asked that question is because I never thought about, um, I never I never went to a paper making workshop ever. I was just like, I'm just gonna make paper, okay, that's gonna be my um, and I just, <laughs> and I just did it. I just was like, okay, this is how it's gonna happen. And I did some research, I bought a book, um, and I watched a couple YouTube videos, and um, I, did, I did that whole process, and I never really, until much later, after I already figured out my process, I actually started really learning more about the fibers and like really getting into it, which in part is also like learning more about like other sort of textile works that I was working on um, at the same time. But um, I think like what I was really interested in it is like how far can I push this material to not necessarily make a cohesive sheet of paper. You know, and so now the process with the sheets of paper is sort of like, how do I just encase things, or how, what other materials will like accept like this thing? So I recently did, I recently started using like mosquito netting and encasing mosquito netting in paper, and then watching that sort of like fall off of the mosquito netting, and obviously the mosquito netting the whole narrative of like, what else can, what else can I sort of drive this? Um, narrative forward, uh, especially now like thinking about what's going on in the US and how this administration is actually dealing with migrants and um, asylum seekers and how, how the border now behaves um, and how there are so many people who are like like banging up against this border that are like need salvation and like are applying for asylum. And you just think about how many blank asylum application documents that they actually are. Because to actually access and get an asylum application document, you have to go to like a staple and print it out and do like a whole thing um, to get it. And then filling out this document, which is like that thick, um, that is not translated <laughs> for a lot of people, is really difficult. And so, um, now I've kind of, now thinking about sort of like how paper behaves in on like a larger context of the border and like pairing it with other materials that's not necessarily um, showing the filtration um, on, the, on the matrix of like the, of, of, of that semi-permeable membrane, but also imbuing this idea of like thinking of migrants as pests and the idea of like protection and like that's how like the mosquito netting and so like mm -hmm. just kind of like slowly kind of evolving like where and how this paper is sticking and like being crusted on things, how it's like fading away, how it's ephemeral. Yeah. Oh that's fantastic, thank you. Yeah, no, and very relevant to, to today, of course. And that's um, the way that you've just described, like, the stack is, you know, because bureaucracy is evil. Mm. <laughs> so that is, uh, yeah, that is very visceral, um, yeah, description of it. Thank you. Um, how do we feel about opening up to questions at this point? Yeah? Okay. Would anybody like to ask the artist a question? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you all for a incredible discussion on this afternoon. Um, my question is uh, for you to hear about um, the process of acquiring the documents that you use to build your paper, mm. um, and what kind of your kind of documents, documents you'd like to use, and how you get them to build your craft. Right. Um, so a lot of it is uh, a combination of the O1 visa application document, uh, which is sort of like character references and a bunch of other things that um, basically talks about how I 
why do I deserve to be an extraordinary alien? Um, and so, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and so, a lot of it is to do with uh, um, uh, with that, and you have to actually print that in triplicate, and that's like a seven word document, um, which is a lot of paper. Uh, and so, uh, and then some of it are just photocopies, so photocopies of like my acceptance. And so what I'm using now a lot is photocopies of my uh, travel parole document, which is basically say, says that I can leave the States, but we don't know whether you can come back or not. Uh, so just stay here. Uh, so, <laughs> so I've been like photocopying that document a lot. Um, obviously, I can't use uh, the originals because I kind of need that, um, but I, I, I photocopy it, and I kind of justify that using the photocopy photocopier machine is like, it's, it, when you apply for a visa, you do have a relationship with a photocopier because you are next to a photocopier all the time, and you just need to, and it's also really irritating to find a photocopier. Um, in general, uh, that's uh, unless you go to Staples, obviously. But like, um, I used to use the one in SVA uh, because I had to travel a lot to like uh, Europe, <laughs> and I had all of these like photocopy documents. So yeah, that's where it is. And then also bits and pieces of whatever my father had sent me. Yeah. Thank you. You had a question? Yeah. Um, I'm. It's more of a comment. I noticed that um, the way you have the. The best, I, what is it called, Matt? First, if you First. Uh, the way they're displayed, to me, is very reminiscent of how, oh, sure. Um, the way you have them, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> the way you have them displayed is very reminiscent to me of how you might see a, an exhibit of Japanese teacups and there's sort of element of wabi-sabi mm -hmm. about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think the, the display of the works on the shelves was, I was also thinking about kind of the library and kind of how do we archive these these memories, but also how do we preserve them? How do we show them? Um, I was thinking about kind of this little curio cabinet that my aunt had, my great aunt had, that was full of kind of little little things. Um, so I wanted to find a way to be able to kind of present them and also to give them kind of that level of respect that I wanted. Um, I mean, if I had piled them on the floor, it would be a very different kind of experience of those. Um, but I was also aware that kind of some of the prints that are that are displayed on the shelves, some of the bundles um, don't have any photographs on them. So I was also wanting to have some be kind of those placeholders for all of those stories that we don't have, mm -hmm. and that we those photos that are long gone or those photos that did never get taken. So and one thing was that they they weren't allowed cameras. All cameras were confiscated. Uh, for the internment, so a lot of my questions when I interview people are, kind of, do you have photographs and, and how did you get those photographs? Um, and it, my answer from a lot of people has been that they just ordered them uh, through the mail catalog and they got shipped cameras. Um, and so that's how these photos exist. Um, so it's been kind of interesting research, but um, yeah, that those shelves were kind of standing for a lot of different things. I did notice, with, uh, just to make a comment, as again, I just noticed that um, blank spaces and the muteness um, appears actually in both of your works in a sense. That there's a lot of white space that is kind of like, ne or negative space, or however you want to, these terms aren't really, but they, they do, they are charged. Um, I think in your case, I've noticed that you know when you when the paper is white and it's kind of um, almost scarified, mm -hmm. um, or it has the remnants of the rust that it's been sitting on, it's it's extremely charged mainly because you know what the other words are all about, and so all together in the context you have this sort of um, you know, very full length spaces, which, mm -hmm. which I find effective in a sense. And, just the emotive, effective quality of the work. Anybody else? Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, to Anna. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there was a lot of silence 
and we get an invitation to start talking about it. And that even if it wasn't somebody's experience, they know somebody else or have a kind of somewhat of a similar experience in some other way, and that it's then you know, people get invited into that fold to start talking and telling stories. And I think that's how I've really kind of framed the work and how I've framed thinking about it and talking about it. Yeah, you mentioned the word beautiful, and I and I was thinking about this, and that you know, um, getting to these subjects through the door, you know, of of like aesthetically beautiful processes that your eye is drawn to, and that you're you're sort of like get involved with, and then there's the layers of the stories unfold, and then it is a tragic, you know, scenario that you arrive at. Um, this is. You know, this is like a, a debate in art history. It's a, it's a question, like, how do you, uh, even all the way back to, I mean, I'll give Rothko as an example, or, you know, how do you, um, how do you reconcile war, tragedy, conflict um, into a beautiful work of art? You know, how does, how do, you, how do you reconcile that? But I think because uh, the complexity is involved in the making. Of it, so I think what we what we have here are two makers, and their investment in making of it, in the making of the work, um, it allows you to travel with them in a sense. So you kind of like travel to the the place where they have arrived in their work, which is the making of a beautiful object, but coming from a very kind of somber place. So the complexity of that is really valuable, I think. Um, I personally like to see when, when works of art have that kind of depth to them, where it's not this flat, I am telling you this is the way it is, and it looks horrible and it is horrible, you know, because it has that some, some sort of limit to it. And I think the experience of the artist, if you can, as a viewer, access the experience of the making of the work while you're looking at it, then you've actually started the process of transforming as well, mm -hmm. I think. That's how I feel as a curator. Any other questions? Uh, question. Yes. Uh, I'm just thinking maybe this is a good segue to end. <laughs> in the right. sense that uh, uh, was there any resolution of being political to a degree with the Canadian government apologizing for the mm -hmm. dislocation? Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite gross in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that happened not long ago. Yeah. I mean, we do have a prime minister who kind of apologizes to a lot of things that mm -hmm. happen in Canada. But, you know, on your resolution, of course, uh, your, yeah. your thing on the situation. Um, so in, in 1989, there was um, an official redress and an official policy given out by the Canadian government around two Japanese Canadians. Um, and it's, it's been interesting. I mean, I was very young at the time, so I wasn't really aware of what was happening or the implicans, implications of that. Um, in terms of different interviews I've done, some people were very involved in the redress movement and found it incredibly helpful and kind of a, a way to move on. Um, but then I talked to other people who didn't really agree with it and felt like it was a bit too neat and tidy. And, you know, you say the apology and then it gets kind of brushed under the carpet and you move on. Um, but interestingly, I actually just learned that because, so in 1989 when this official apology was, the redress movement happened, the Japanese Canadians worked really closely with that government and um, kind of in that partnership, they kind of drafted up kind of a process for redress. And so different people are currently are then kind of looking for apologies, and this has become a benchmark for them. So there's been a apologies given out to, um, there's been kind of a whole horror around uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women, and so there's an apology kind of coming together, but they're all going back to the redress through the Japanese Canadian kind of acknowledgement. Um, so that's been an interesting kind of part of that history that's now continuing to flow out. Um, but again, you know, history's always complicated. <laughs> Great. I think on that note, we could go on for another hour. But it's <laughs> more insightful and, and productive artist talks I've been to. It's layered so much more on top of what we already know, what's in the catalog. So, Jean, 
uh, Emma and Tahir in the audience. Thank you so much.